Today we delve into the lore of the Rings of Power. How did they come to be? Who forged them and exactly how corruptive were they to each race? Were the dwarves affected as much as the humans? And why were the elves able to use the power of their three rings without fear of Sauron's domination? The films leave it vague at best, but that's why I'm here. Let's discuss the Rings of Power. Hi everyone, and welcome to Fables of the Fellowship. My name is Eric, and on this channel we will take a journey throughout the world of Arda, traversing all the ages of Middle-earth, as well as the times before and after what you may have seen in the films. So relax, grab a warm beverage, and join me as we sail through the genius of J.R.R. Tolkien. You have my soul. And you have my bow. And my axe. After the defeat of Morgoth near the end of the First Age, Sauron sought to dominate Middle-earth by subtler means. It's also important to note, Sauron originally served the Valar Aule, the smith of the Valar. Under Aule, Sauron became unsurpassed in the techniques of the forge. He knew his skills would be of great desire, so he assumed a more pleasing form to deceive the elves and aid them in the creation of the Rings of Power. However, his real intent was to corrupt and control them. As Anatar, Lord of Gifts, he approached various elven kingdoms with his offer of knowledge and assistance in ring-making. Significantly, he was rejected by the elves of Linden, where Gilgalad, the High King of the Noldor, and Elrond, his herald, were wary of him. They mistrusted Anatar due to their keen perception and foresight. Galadriel, also residing in Linden at the time, advised against trusting Anatar as well. Her intuition and experience having lived in Valinor and witnessed the deception of Melkor himself made her suspicious of his true intentions. And that brings us to the elven smiths of Aragion led by Master Smith Celebrimbor. Celebrimbor was an unbelievable craftsman. His grandfather was none other than Feanor who created the three Silmarils, the most treasured jewels in the history of Arda. Side note, you gamers out there may have heard this name before if you've ever played Shadow of Mordor or Shadow of War. Celebrimbor is one of the main protagonists. The game follows his fall from grace, and they're amazing. But back to the story. Sauron is welcomed by Celebrimbor with open arms in the year 1200 of the Second Age. Unlike Gilgalad, Elrond, and Galadriel, he was deceived by Anatar's guise and fair words. His desire for knowledge and experience, coupled with his ambition to create something great, made him susceptible to his manipulation. Sauron, as Anatar, plays on these desires, teaching Celebrimbor and the Smiths of Aragion the art of ring-making over the next four centuries. This leads to the creation of the Lesser Rings of Power, to which we don't know the exact amount, as well as 16 Great Rings of Power that Sauron was aware of. Celebrimbor forges the three elven rings in secret, without Sauron's direct involvement or knowledge. Nenya was given to Galadriel, Narya to High King Gilgalad, and Vilya to Elrond. After centuries of deceit, we come to the year 1600 of the Second Age. In the fiery depths of Mount Doom, Sauron secretly forges the One Ring, a master ring to control all others inscribed with the ominous words. Three rings for the elven kings under the sky, seven for the dwarf lords in their halls of stone, nine for mortal men doomed to die, one for the dark lord on his dark throne in the land of Mordor where the shadows lie. One ring to rule them all. One ring to find them. One ring to bring them all. And in the darkness, bind them in the land of Mordor, where the shadows lie. This was the linchpin of Sauron's plan to conquer Middle-earth. 
This ring held a part of Sauron's own power, making it an object of immense and perilous might. It may be best to think of the ring as Sauron's essence or soul. To dominate the others, he had to give everything to the ring. It granted him unrivaled power, but if the ring was lost or destroyed, the same fate would befall the creator. As Sauron places the one ring on his finger, the elves wearing the three immediately become aware of his presence and intentions. They sensed his attempt to dominate their wills, revealing his true nature and the deceit he had employed. This sudden and alarming revelation forced the elves to remove their rings to escape Sauron's influence. Sauron had bided his time for 400 years. He has revealed his true identity by putting on the One Ring, and he declares war against the elves. He will do whatever it takes to steal his creations back from Celebrimbor. His army invades Eregion, and the realms suffer devastating losses. Its capital, Ulstin Edhil, where the rings were forged, is destroyed. Celebrimbor is captured by Sauron's forces and tortured. Sauron manages to recover the Nine Rings for Men and the Seven for the Dwarves, but he fails to locate the Three Elven Rings. The Elves had managed to hide them successfully. Celebrimbor dies under torture, refusing to yield to Sauron's demands. The Rings were distributed thus. Nine to mortal men, who fell into shadow, as Nazgul. Seven to the Dwarves, who proved resistant to direct control and three to the elves, used to preserve and protect their realms. Each ring wielded influence according to its bearer's nature, playing a pivotal role in the unfolding history of Middle-earth. We will start with the three elven rings. Nenya, powered by the element of water, Narya, powered by fire, and Vilya by air. Unlike the others, these rings were untouched by Sauron's direct influence as Celebrimbor forged them secretly but they could not be used while Sauron wore the One. So they stayed hidden until Sauron was defeated by the last alliance of elves and men. Here, High King Gilgalad is struck down and his ring is passed to Círdan after Sauron's defeat. This allowed the elves to use them without falling under Sauron's control, but with a critical caveat. Their power was directly tied to the One Ring. Should Sauron ever reclaim it, he would again dominate all. Each of these rings bestowed unique abilities aligned with their respective bearers' nature and realms. Nenya, the Ring of Water, worn by Galadriel, had the power of preservation and protection, sustaining the beauty and timelessness of Lothorian. Narya, the Ring of Fire, now given to Gandalf by Círdan, kindled courage and resistance against tyranny and despair, particularly during dark times. And finally, Vilya, the Ring of Air, the mightiest of the three, was worn by Elrond. It had the power to heal and preserve, playing a crucial role in maintaining the sanctity of Rivendell as a refuge and a place of wisdom. The Elven Rings thus were instruments of healing, preservation, and inspiration. They countered the decay and desolation brought by Sauron, embodying the Elves' deep connection with the natural world and their desire to maintain harmony and beauty in Middle-earth. Another quick side note, if you wanted to know why Gandalf was given the ring by Círdan, go check out my first video posted about a week ago of Who is Gandalf? The Journey of Olorin the Maya, where we detail who Gandalf was and why he was so pivotal to the quest of defeating Sauron. Now moving along to the resistance and influence of the Dwarven Rings. After we discussed the Elven Rings, let's delve into the Seven Rings given to the Dwarves. Unlike men, the Dwarves proved remarkably resistant to Sauron's influence. Their resilience stemmed from their creator, Aule the Smith, who imbued them with a strong will and a natural resistance to external domination. The Dwarven Rings, however, did amplify certain traits within their bearers. They heightened the Dwarves' innate passion for craftsmanship and their desire for wealth particularly gold. This led to increased mining and treasure hoarding, which inadvertently awoke dangerous creatures like dragons and balrogs. Sauron's intent was to corrupt the dwarves through greed and material obsession, but he could not bend their will to his own as he did with men. Each ring also granted its wearer increased longevity and the ability to amass great wealth which contributed to the prosperity but also the isolation of their realms. 
the rings while not enslaving the dwarves sowed seeds of discord and strife, indirectly furthering Sauron's agenda of spreading malice and distrust among the free peoples of Middle-earth. Ultimately, most of the dwarven rings were consumed by dragon fire or reclaimed by Sauron. Their fates intertwined with the tumultuous history of the dwarves in the Second and Third Ages. These rings serve as a testament to the dwarves' endurance and their ability to resist external corruption, albeit at the cost of internal strife and greed. Moving from the dwarves to men, the story takes a darker turn. These nine rings had the most dramatic and devastating effects. Unlike the dwarves, men were far more susceptible to their corrupting influence. This susceptibility can be attributed to the inherent human traits of ambition and the desire for power, which Sauron exploited masterfully. The rings granted their bearers great power and unnaturally long lives, appealing to their deepest desires for dominance and rule. They became glorious kings and warriors. However, the power came at a grave cost. Over time, the ring bearers became enslaved to the will of Sauron, losing their free will and humanity. They quite literally faded into darkness, mere shadows of their former selves, known in legend as the Nazgul, or Ring Wraiths. Their transition into these ghostly figures symbolized the loss of their souls and identities to the One Ring's dominion. Just as Sauron was, they were now bound to the fate of the One Ring. The Nazgul became Sauron's most feared servants. They were formidable in battle, inspiring terror on the ground and in the air. I believe this tragic fate illustrates the central theme of Tolkien's work, the corrupting influence of power and the peril of yielding to temptation. But I'm definitely open to your thoughts. Please let me know what you think in the comments. Okay, we probably know most of what happens next, but let's catch up. Sauron was immediately defeated by the destruction of the ring at the Cracks of Doom, along with all eight remaining Nazgul. It is said that their mounts were killed in the eruption whilst their form and power dissipated forever. All 16 rings had now lost their power, and as such, they were no longer of aid to their bearers. The struggle to destroy the One Ring forms the heart of Lord of the Rings narrative. From Isildur to Gollum, and finally, from Bilbo to Frodo's perilous quest, the ring weaves a tale of corruption heroism, and sacrifice. This quest against overwhelming odds highlights the enduring theme of hope in Tolkien's work. Another quick side note, Isildur's name has been tarnished by the movies, and I tend to write that wrong in a future video. But I digress. Okay, let's bring it home. I don't want you to fall into the trope of light versus dark. Tolkien deserves more of us than that. It's there, but the rings of power remind us of the allure of power and the peril it brings, not just to those who wield it, but to all who are touched by it. They represent the duality of creation and destruction, the fine line between using one's skills for the greater good or for dominion over others. True power lies not in a piece of jewelry, but in the enduring qualities of compassion friendship, and sacrifice. The journey of the Rings of Power is a mirror to our own challenges and choices. It is a reminder that while darkness may rise, the light of hope, unity, and courage will always stand against it. So do you think I'm way off? Am I missing anything? Please, I would love any comments of what you guys think thematically that the Lord of the Rings is all about. All right, folks, we've reached our destination and the ship has come to dock in the Undying Lands. If you've enjoyed your trip, I can grant you free travel every week. All you have to do is click subscribe. And if you'd like to support even further, check out my Patreon page for some extras that I don't share here. My sincerest thank yous. Until next time, friends.